Praise the Lord. Um, I'm excited to be here. And I won't say what he just said for me not to say again, but you know, praise the Lord. I'm excited to be among you and I'm very honored and privileged that he would ask me. And he's right, I did reply fast, but funny story is when he texted me and invited me, I was kind of surprised. And so I really texted him back really quick. But when I texted him back, I said, uh, Pastor Mike. And then he responded, uh, my name is not Pastor Mike, it's Pastor Matt. <laughs> and he was, and the funny thing, he went on to say, you know, it's not, I'm the sinful tax collector before Jesus, not the <laughs> angel like Michael. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of funny, and I was like, it made me kind of comfortable, and I was like, oh, this pastor's pretty cool. I think we'll get along pretty good. And um, Ange and I has, have told me that really good things about you guys. She said you guys are like family, and so it made me feel at home also. So praise the Lord. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to go ahead and go to our text today. If you go open your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13. And I'm going to begin reading from verse 8. So Romans chapter 13 and verse 8. And when you're there, just give me a big amen. 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 All right. In verse 8, it says, Owe no man anything but to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For this you shall not commit adultery, you shall not kill, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there be any other commandment is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 10, love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And this is where I want to kind of get at verse 11. And that, knowing the time, and now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. And tonight I'm just going to present a message before you. I believe that the Lord has laid on my heart. And I'm entitling it, Wake Up Call. Amen. Wake Up Call. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you, Lord, for this day that you've made, Lord. Help us to continue to rejoice in it, O oh God, and to be glad in it, O oh God, for this is the day that you have made, God. We praise you in this place, O oh God. We worship you in this place, O oh God. You be high and lifted up in this place, O oh God. We magnify your name, God. Hallelujah. We exalt you in this place, O oh God. This is your house, O oh God. Have your way in every heart, O oh God. And I pray that you would anoint me, O oh God, to speak your word and not my own, God. That you would use me, O oh God, for your glory, O oh God, as your vessel, O oh God. That you would increase, O oh God, and that I would decrease, O oh God. And give us the word, Lord, that we'd be able to embed into our hearts tonight, O oh God. That we would not forget, Lord, but that we would take with us tonight, Lord. As we're careful to give you all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, amen. amen. Well, praise the Lord. Well, the book of Romans, as some of you guys might already know, is really considered as the roadmap or the blueprint for life and living, and really it's how I understood the message of the cross. And in verse, chapters 4 and 5 you'll find justification and how we are justified by faith alone. And then when you go down to verses 6 and 7 and 8, it'll really show you, tell you how we are sanctified by faith. So not only are we justified by faith, but we are also living by faith. We're being sanctified now by faith. And then in chapters 12 through 16, as we find chapter 13 falls in this category, it's really about the practical side of the message of the cross. It's really about application. And that's what I want to get to you guys tonight is the practical side of the message of the cross. Because how many of you guys know it's not just the terminology, it's not just something that we know right here, but it's got to get from our minds to our heart and down to our feet. Amen. It's, there should be a practical side. It's not just the first 
The first few chapters of Romans talks about the doctrinal truth. And then the last chapters talk about the practical side of how we should apply it in our lives. Amen. And he says right here in verse, chapter, verse 11, And that, knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believed. When he says, and that, he's referring to the first few verses that are wrote in verses 9, 8, 9, and 10. If you guys can just follow me, I'm going to kind of go through the text a little bit before I get to what I really want to say. In verse 11, when he says, and that, that, that word that is referring to the verses 8, 9, and 10, when he says, for who, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. And then in verse 10, he says, love works no ill to his neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of of the law. Basically, love is what motivates us. And it's not just any kind of love. It's the agape kind of love. It's the God kind of love. It's the sacrificial kind of love. It's the love that Jesus showed on the cross when he died for us. Yes. That kind of love is what motivates him. And he says, and that, knowing that, knowing the time and how it is high time to awake of sleep. Now that word knowing means really means seeing or to perceive. Or to be aware of. Not that you're aware of the time that we're at right now. Not that you're aware of what's happening now. It is high time that we awake. Mm -hmm. High time really means the hour. This hour. At this time, it's time to awake mm -hmm. from sleep. It's time to rise up from your sleep. It's time to wake up mm -hmm. from your sleep. Amen. Amen. And sleep really means... It's really interesting to me. Sleep really means, of course, it means... Sleep. But, but spiritually speaking, it's talking about being slothful or sluggish. And I kind of took that word slothful and I thought, hmm, a sloth. Anybody know what the sloth is? It's a mammal that lives in the tropical areas. And really, a sloth is a slowing, moving mammal. Really, if you've seen one, I just recently looked at it just to be clear what I was talking about. I mean, they, they move this slow. No, forgive me for being very slow. <laughs> Literally that slow, that's how sloths move. And this is what he's saying. He's saying knowing the time, now that you see and now that you're aware of the time, the season that we're at right now, and the hour that we're at, it's time to awake from your sleep. It's time to wake up. It's time to rise up out of that sleep. And when he says asleep, now sloths, they sleep up to 20 hours. I thought that was interesting. I went on to National Geographic and I looked up sloth, you know, I wanted to know what they really were and their habitation and everything. And it said that they literally sleep up to 20 hours a day with four hours left in the day. <laughs> right, I thought that was interesting. And it says, but even when they're awake, they barely move. Wow. They're just hanging on a tree, basically. That's what they do all day. When they're sleeping and when they're awake, they barely move. And they move once. And once a week do they use the restroom. So I'm telling you, they just stay in their spot under that tree or hanging down from that tree. And it says, in fact, they're so incredibly sluggish and slow and lazy that algae actually grows on their fur. Wow. That's how slow they are, and that's how in one permanent place that they're always at, that they actually have the algae from the trees and all the other plants grow on their fur. And I thought to myself, okay, the sloth stays in the same place all day, really doing nothing, that they start to look like the area that they're around. They start looking like the trees. They start to blend in with the trees. They start to blend in with the nature and the world around them. And this is what Paul had told us to do. He told us to awake out of that sleep. To awake up out of this world. Because he's been called to a higher, Amen. a higher place. He said, this is the season. And he said, now. He didn't say tomorrow. He said now. And in fact, that means that it's already time to wake up. It's already past time to wake up from that sleep. It's way past time. And that we should no longer indulge in that sleep, spiritually speaking. Amen. And he says, for now is our salvation nearer than 
when we believe. Salvation is nearer than when we believe. And this is referring, of course, not to our when we initially got saved, but this is talking about our coming resurrection and the rapture when Jesus comes back. And basically, Paul is implying since the first day you got saved until now, it's getting closer to Jesus' coming. So what are you doing? Are you still asleep? And he says it's about time that we wake up. Amen. Wake up to what? Well, here I go. And he says, verse 12, the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Now night, this is literally referring to, Paul likes to use like these metaphors like night and day. And um, also, he says right here, night is literally referring to the time for deeds of sin and shame. Because usually at night, I should know because before I was saved that night, sin was going on, rapid in my life. And this is what he refers to as metaphorically speaking, the time, night really means the time for deeds of sin and, sh and shame, the time of more stupidity and darkness. This is what he's referring to. He says, the night has been far long to spent, that the day is at hand, that the, that the day is right now. And day really refers to the time when crime and the acts of the same sort are no longer done, when they're put away with. So what Paul is really saying is the night has been far long to spend that the day is at hand for us to wake up and to put off these things of the night. Mm -hmm. And he says, let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Now, cast off literally means to put off, to put off, to take off. And like we, I'm looking at this right here, Adam, the old man, we've learned that our, our old man has been crucified. And that we should be taking off those old man clothes. And right here he says that let us therefore cast off the works of darkness. Now Paul had already told the Romans in this, the Roman Christians here, how to live. He already explained to them that you're justified by faith and you are being sanctified by faith. And now he's telling them how we apply this. We need to take off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of of light. Now armor was kind of like a metaphor that he used talking about a soldier's armor. And basically when Paul was saying this, he was saying usually he was talking about a soldier who would wake up before dawn, wake up before the break of day, wake up before the sunrise, and who would prepare himself. He would put on his armor and he would gather his weapons and he would just look out into the horizon preparing for battle ready before the day was up, ready before the sun was up for battle. And this is what he's telling us. Paul is telling us, let us put on the armor of light. Let us be the soldiers that God has called us for the warfare that he's called us to. Let us get up out of our spiritual slumber and let us go forth into the forefront that he's called us to as good soldiers, Amen. fighting the good fight Amen. of faith. He's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and he told us to put on the armor of light. Yes. To cast off, we should no longer, we should no longer be in the deeds of the darkness, no longer. You know, sometimes, I've got to be careful what I say, sometimes, I've heard it from people, let me just say that, testimonies from others, you know, they received the message of the cross. They were saved at the law, ah, out of law. And so they might gotta get a mindset, well, well, we don't have to do these works because I'm not justified by these works. Well, yes, you're not justified by these works. And nor are you sanctified by these works, but you are saved to do these good works. <coughs> this is not something that saved you and nor can bring you righteousness, but you are saved to do these good works. This is the practical side of the message of the cross. This is the application side of the message of the cross because it's not something I want you to know up here. It's not something that I just want to tell you and preach, but it's something that I don't want to live. It's something that I want the world to see. It's something I want to reflect of Christ. So it's not just terminology. 
I feel like God wanted me to bring the practical side of what we should be doing, putting off, and then putting on the armor of light. And soldiers, they have to do this every day. <laughs> so let me tell you, this kind of made me to think it's not just when we first understood the message of the cross, when we first got that ooh, moment of revelation, because let me tell you, I got it before because I was under law. And it set me free. But I began to study these soldiers, and they did this constantly, every single day, prepared for battle before the day was even begun. And I thought to myself, well, sometimes I can't even wake up. when I know I should be waking up when God's really tugging on me to pray or whatever. Sometimes I'm late to school, honesty. And God's called us to be to wake up out of our sleep, to rise up before the day has begun to be prayer for battle. Why? Because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're fighting against principalities and darkness. That's what we're fighting against. And let me tell you, they don't stop. We have no, we have no competition against them. We really don't. And this is why Paul exhorts us to put on the armor of light before daylight comes. To be ready before the sun comes out. To be on guard, to be watching, and to be praying before the day starts. Before you start your day. We've got to be ready. Because when I look around in this world, it's so much different when I got, when I was growing up. I'm 27 now. And growing up, even, I hear it a lot from like my parents and my grandparents and other how, you know, what we're seeing now, they would have never saw. But even at my age, 27, when I was growing up, we've never seen a cuss word in the commercial or any kind of immorality. Mm. But now it is rampant. Mm. Now I see boys wanting to be girls. Mm. I see TV shows with girls wanting to be guys. Mm. And I see men sleeping together all over, mm. rampant. Mm. And the world doesn't care. Mm. That's right. That's right. That's right. Mm. And Paul had in mind that Christ was coming soon. He had in mind that Christ could be here any moment. And so he was exhorting them from the time you got saved until the present time. Rise. Wake up from your sleep. Be on guard. Be ready. Be on guard. Watch and pray. <coughs> because the night has been far long to spend. And the day is at hand. The day of the Lord is at hand. Yes. And he can come anytime. Yes. And what are we doing? Spiritually slumber? Mm. Are we a spiritual sloth? Mm. And I say that because God had to speak that to me first. <gasps> a sloth. Mm. Like we said, they begin, they move like this. Mm. They're so comfortable in their habitation mm. that they don't want to go anywhere else. Mm. They don't want to even move. They sleep for 20 hours a day. And they start looking like the forest around them. And he's calling us out of that spiritually to not be spiritually a sloth, not to be a spiritual sloth, and not to be waking out of our spiritual slumber. And to go forth as good soldiers. Because the message of the cross is not something I can just state to you. It really is not. It's a life lived. And he says right here in verse 13, Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering, chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He said, Put on ye the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust of. That's the only way we can really go in battle. Is as we put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Putting on the full armor of God. Because we're in a battle that's much serious than we can see. If we could really, I've heard preachers say, if we could really see. I think it was one of these girls has mentioned it to me. If we could really see what's happening in the spiritual world. How much more would we be alert? How much more would we wake up from our sleep? How much more would we, we be watching and praying at all hours of the night, waking up before the day even starts? If we could really see the demons in hell coming against our families, 
against our babies, against our churches, against our schools, would we really be a work? And I believe that's why God said to live by faith. Because we're supposed to trust in him and work out our faith. And, I, and when I say that, I mean we are saved to do these good works. And it should be evident in our lives. We should be living like Jesus is coming tomorrow. And not because I'm scared because he might just rapture up the church. That's right. Yes. Because, but because I want to see the church ready. Yes. I want to see his bride ready. I want to see lost souls saved. And I want to see lives in the church change. I don't want to see them bound. But understanding the message of the cross from here to here and to their feet. Because I had it up here for a year and was still bound. And that's my heart today is that we get it from here to here and to our feet. That we would walk out the message of the cross. Not just preach it, but walk out the message of the cross. Because this was not just revelated to each and every one of us for no reason. Just to have, oh... Okay, I don't, I'm not, I don't have to do these good works. Yes, you do. And I'm not trying to put you under law. I'm not. But you are saved to do these good works. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the armor of light. Be ready before the daylight comes. Because your enemy, the adversary, is crawling around to steal, kill, and destroy. Utterly destroy your body. Your mind, your soul, your church, your family, your finances, your everything he's trying to destroy and take away your joy. Mm -hmm. Turn it into fear. Mm. We've all experienced it. Mm. We've all had times, moments of doubt, mm -hmm. moments of fear. Mm -hmm. And that's a time we had Evangelist Dan Burke today in, in our chapel and he was talking about Keeping your eyes on Jesus. We start to doubt and we start to fear when our focus is starting shifting at other things, at other circumstances, because our eyes are not fixed on Jesus, because our, our, we haven't clothed ourselves in the Lord Jesus Christ. We haven't put on the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, literally, when you put on, it really means clothing. So we're covering ourselves. So that when the enemy comes in like a flood, you got Jesus on. Hallelujah. You got Jesus as your victor going before you. But when you're not ready, when you don't have this armor on, watch out. Because the enemy plays for keeps. And Paul's heart, I could see Paul's heart. He wasn't saying this name. This is his heart. That his church, that these Romans, that the Christians be ready, be on alert. Be on alert. Watch. Pray like a good soldier. I mean, these soldiers would line up. They all had the, the, it was nighttime still, of course. And they would put on armor after armor, helmet, and get their weapon on the side. And would just sit back, looking at the horizon, waiting for the enemy to come. Because they were ready. Spiritually speaking, if we're not ready, and we wake up and daylight's coming, we don't have our armor on. We don't have our weapons for us, and the enemy's already past the horizon. He's already up close in your face. Mm -hmm. And we start to worry. I know this for a fact that when I start my day off in a rushing mood, I don't pray. I don't mean read my word. I just go about my day. I mean, I start to get fussy. I start to get just all angry. And I know it's because I didn't start my day right. And I know there's other people in here who can testify to that. If you don't start your day right, I mean, it's just a complete mess. You get angry at your sister or your husband or your wife. You start complaining about something because we didn't start our day out right. Amen. And I believe Paul was trying to exhort them. I mean, before your day starts, have it in your mind to arise. Put on your armor. Ready for battle. Because the enemy is crawling, like I said. I look around in this world and it just really breaks my heart. Because I have two nieces and a nine month, almost nine month old nephew. When I look at them, my heart kind of gets heavy because I know what the world they're gonna grow up in. 
You know, they're not my kids. They're just my nieces and my nephew. And so all I can do is pray for them and do what I can when I'm watching them. But when I look at this world and at the world that they're going to grow up into, my heart breaks. Because they're going to be exposed to more sin that even our minds can comprehend right now. Let me tell you, because I would have never thought this, what I'm seeing right now. I would have never thought that as a child. I would have never thought of that. Because I grew up knowing that it was wrong for a man to be with a man and with a girl to be with a girl. I grew up knowing that that was wrong. But now kids are growing up to see this as a normal thing. It's normal now. It's not considered sin. If you say it's sin, well, someone's going to condemn you. Someone's going to try to shut you up and someone's going to try to shut you down. We can't even speak about it anymore without being persecuted. If we say this to someone in the world, if I was to say this to one of my old friends, they'll look at me like kind of crazy. And What are you talking about? You should love them. Oh, yes, I love them so much that I want to... I want them to know Jesus to save them out of their sin. And that's why I believe that Paul entered in. I mean, he wrote these other words. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting, not in drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. There is a way that a Christian should walk. Amen. There is a way that a Christian should present themselves. There is a way that a Christian should look different from the world. We should be set apart. <clears throat> and Paul sets this out. Just a few themes. Just a few themes. They're not a whole bunch of things, but it's not like he was already explained to them that we're not justified. We're not sanctified by law. But he still exhorts them not to do these things right. after he explained all of this. So understand, it's still important if you hear your pastor or if you hear some minister tell you not to live a certain way, not to do certain things. Why? Because we are the testimony of Christ. You are not your own. You were bought with the Christ to win the lost world. A dying world. In fact, it looks dead. And it is dead. There is no life so we should look different, my brother and my sister. We should be set about, apart. We need to be called. We've been called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. But are we living out this message? Is it just something we've heard and are happy about it? Because, yeah, I'm not justified by my works. I'm not sanctified by my works. Is it something that we're just getting? Or are we really letting it come from here to our hearts? And God change us so that we can walk it out into this dying world who needs to know that Jesus came to die for them mm -hmm. and that they can be set free mm -hmm. and that they can live in liberty and in victory, mm -hmm. no longer bound by the enemy. Mm -hmm. But we got to be set apart. We shouldn't be living like the world. We shouldn't be looking like the world. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't be behaving our way as the world. Mm -hmm. We are different. Amen. We are different. Amen. We should be conforming into the image of Christ. Literally, if you think about it, we're putting on Christ. He's my covering. So when I walk up anywhere I go, into the public places, mm. in the restaurants, in the stores, wherever I'm at with my family members who are not saved, I want them to see Jesus. Amen. I want them to know that there is a difference, that I am not of the world. That I'm not like them who are not saved. I want there to be a difference. I want them to know that I've even been in the presence of God. That's why I've been asking the Lord. I desire. Lord, you've called me out, Lord. Let it be so known that when they come in my midst, they're going to sense your presence. Yes. Why? Because I've awoken from my sleep before my day has started. And it's not just a one-time thing. It was daily. These soldiers had to do this daily. And before they even got on battle, I'm not sure how long a soldier in the USA prepares to be a soldier or how many weeks they have in training, but I know it's months. I had a brother-in-law who was in training for a long time before he could actually be qualified 
as a soldier or whatever, however they do that. So before the day, they had, before preparing for battle, they had to be ready, made ready soldiers and seen fit to fight on the battle. Does God see you fit to fight for him? Does he see you fit to fight in the battle? Does he see, does God the Father, does he see Christ? Is the Holy Spirit welcome in you? Does he feel at home? The message of the cross really needs to be applied in our lives. It should work out something in us. I don't want to just stand up here and quote it to you guys because I learned it from Bible college. But let me tell you, I was in Bible college for a year and I still didn't get it. I thought I did. Let me tell you, I went out and told everybody, but it wasn't really showing in my life. Right. So, because that shows that you can know it all up here. That's right. Right. That's right. <laughs> but it's really not in your words, but in your actions mm. oh, and in the way you live. In the way that you con conduct your life and order your life. It's really a lifestyle. Amen. That's what it is. The message of the cross should be a lifestyle. Yes. Not just the message, a lifestyle. Amen. To each and every one of us. Amen. Paul was really saying when Paul said this, he was saying it in a tone, really, there's, his tone was really can be said in the sentence that there is no time to waste. Mm -hmm. Enough time was already wasted mm -hmm. since the day you got saved until now. There should be spiritual growth. There should be maturity. We should be growing in the word, growing in his grace and in his knowledge. We should be growing in it. And the Lord make me evaluate my own life as I should, as each message that I ever deliver that I should look at myself and how much change has occurred since the day I got saved till now. And it's about seven years, a little over seven years. How much change has, how much progress has there been since I've understood the message of the cross? I'll go a little further. How much progress? How long have you been sitting under the message of the cross? and understood it and got a revelation of it, how long and how much has changed in your own life? How much has it changed your life? And how much has it changed those around you also? Mm -hmm. Because it definitely should have an effect mm -hmm. on those that you're surrounded by, your family members, mm -hmm. your co-workers, mm -hmm. your children. Mm -hmm. There should be an effect mm -hmm. because there's power in this message. That's right. Hallelujah. Power to save the lost Hallelujah. and power to free the bound who is saved. Mm. Power. Power. But does our life really show that power? What we believe, does it really show forth in our lives to other people? This is the challenge that the Lord had to show me. What is my life really exemplifying? What am I really... What am I standing for? What is it, what, is, what comes? What do people think about when they see me, or people who know me for who've known me for a long time? Do they know that I'm I'm different? Do they know that I'm set apart? Do they know that I love Jesus? Do they know that I don't even desire the things of the world? Do they know? We're not to be closet Christians or sleepy Christians or slothful Christians we're not supposed to that's not what God has called us to he's called us to a higher place mm -hmm. yeah. to live out this gospel because we weren't saved just to come to church mm -hmm. but we were saved to see the lost saved Hallelujah. Hallelujah. this is why we are saved uh, the Lord has put it in my heart because I was thinking one day I was like on my own self because when I first got saved I mean the Lord changed my life drastically, let me tell you. I mean, I was the heathen of the heathens, the sinners of the sinners. That was me. And I really was. So when God saved me, though, I was in my room. It was around 2 o'clock in the morning. And I just remember someone had shared about Jesus. And I was just, I mean, I was having the time of my life. I was 20 years old, just doing whatever I want, partying, 
all those kind of things, drugs, alcohol, whatever, you name it, that was what I was doing. But I was supposed to go out with some of my friends one night. And just for some reason, I just, I couldn't, I didn't, I didn't want to. There was something that was holding me down and I, I didn't understand it. But I felt so depressed. You know, even though I was having a good time with my friends, I mean, they would, ne they would have never, could never tell that I was depressed. You know, I, I got to a point where I really didn't care about my own life. I didn't care if I was to die tomorrow because I really didn't know. I mean, I never knew really, never wasn't really talked about he heaven and hell. Really, it was just heaven. So I didn't know there was a bad place, you know, that I was going to go to. So I didn't really care about life, really. It was just whatever. But I remembered someone sharing with me about Jesus. And I don't remember everything this person said. I don't remember everything because I was just there on accident. But I remember the name Jesus. And so at 2 o'clock in the morning, I called out that name. And I kid you not, instantly a weight was lifted. And I began to weep. I mean, it was like a waterfall, like nonstop. I just felt free. I felt like literally, like if, now that I know the terms, that chains really broke off. And I felt such extreme joy in my heart. So much peace just flood my heart. And I couldn't explain it. But I was just extremely joyful that I got up out of my bed at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was like, whoa, what is this? I looked at my phone. I saw all the music that I was listening to. I kid you not, I spent two hours deleting all my music, throwing away all my music, every CD. I went to my closet, looked at all the clothes I used to wear. Oh man, I grabbed the trash bag and I put it all in that bag. <laughs> most of it, because most of it cannot be worn anymore. But it was, no one had to tell me that. Just Jesus just changed my life in an instant <laughs> and in a moment. Amen. Amen. Jesus changed me. And so I start to think, Okay, Lord, when I first got saved, I was just so fired up. I mean, I would go in the grocery store and I was sharing with people. I mean, I feel the Lord was leading me to certain people to share it, you know, and they would accept the Lord and whatnot. I just had such a zeal in me and fire just to do whatever, just to see lost, the souls, lost souls saved. And then I, seven years later, I started, to, the Lord started making me reevaluate my life. And just sometimes you got to do that, just look back, you know, your progress and how you're doing. And I looked back. And I was looking at now, and, and I just began to cry to myself when I was praying because I realized I'm not doing the same thing that I used to do when I first got saved. I mean, sharing the gospel like no other. And I started to think, am I just going to school just to go to school? <laughs> just so I can step on a pulpit? Because I know the Lord called me to ministry. Is that what I'm doing? Or am I just coming to church? After church, we go out to eat, go back home, and that's it. And the Lord reminded me of when he first saved me, the heart that I had, the genuine, the genuine love that I had in my heart, to see souls saved, and reminded me of this. What am I doing now? I've learned the message of the cross. I know when I was first, well, let me say this, when I was first saved, I was, I was bound by law, but I didn't know it. It was ignorance. You know, I, I, but I was living for the Lord the best way I can. But when I got the message of the cross, and I've been knowing it now for about maybe three, four years, where it's really changed my life, and I started to think, since then, what have I been doing with this gospel? And I was struck at the heart because I haven't really been doing what I should be doing is in seeing the lost souls saved. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not here just to attend church. We're not here just to sing a few songs mm -hmm. to gather on Sundays, sometimes when to say mm -hmm. maybe a Bible study and maybe a prayer meeting, maybe. And to be honest, the prayer meetings I've been, there's very few and I asked the Lord, why? There's very few at prayer meetings. I mean, you call a worship, people will show up. Call a prayer meeting, it's probably 5% of the church, or even less. 5% is a good number. 
showing up at prayer meetings. And I began to ask the Lord. He's been showing me all these things. Why? To ask that question, why? Why isn't this happening in my life? What am I doing? Well, and I was given this scripture to arise, <laughs> awake from your sleep, be prepared, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put off the old man, put off all these things and, and ask the Lord. And it says right here, prior to the verse 11, as I read, verse 10, it says, love is the fulfilling of the law. And I have to ask the Lord to bring that love back into my heart. And this is talking about towards our neighbor. Love works no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And it says in the previous verse that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Think about that. As yourself. How much do you love yourself? Not everybody talk and tell me how much you love yourself. But it says to love your neighbor as yourself. And you're feeding yourself the word. You're coming to church. You're praying as we should be, you know, doing all these Christian disciplines, but what about your neighbor? Mm -hmm. What about the person you just passed by? Maybe at a restaurant, your waiter? I'm talking to myself. I ask God to constrain me so much and compel me so much with his love that it gave me a heart to really see the lost soul saved. Mm -hmm. Not just growth in my own life, not just growth in my brothers and sisters who are saved, mm -hmm. but to have such a heart mm -hmm. that everyone that I come across, that I share the gospel with, that the Lord will at least present me, because I've heard one pastor say it this way, that, or someone shared about this, said that this, I don't remember who it was, but a man had asked that if God would just give him one person a day to see saved. And God was faithful to do that. Amen. Every day he saw a man Amen. saved. And I say that because I'm asking the same thing now. Lord, get me up out of my comfort zone. Wake me up out of my sleep so that I can wake up and I can rise up and go forth as a good soldier. Seeking the lost. And that starts also with our family members. And maybe you don't go out much. A lot of I bet all, all of us have know somebody who is not saved. I bet each and every one of us can probably think of someone who is not saved. And so that's just really a challenge to all of us tonight is just to really give us that heart, Lord, and to be on guard, to be ready up out of our sleep. Let me tell you, physically speaking, I love my sleep. <laughs> physically, I am not a morning person. I really am not. Well, since I came to Bible college, um, we have a professor, um, <coughs> Brother David Borg, and he began teaching on prayer, and then he also started these prayer meetings at 6.15 in the morning. And like I said, I'm not a morning person, but I felt so compelled to go. And I started going, and I mean, I, man, God, literally, I mean, through my prayer life that I've gained at my being at school and sitting under the, the most wonderful professors, I mean, it's been worth it waking up at 6 feet 15 in the morning. And even 5 o'clock when I do wake up at 5 o'clock for my own prayer, I mean, it's been worth it. Amen. But let me tell you, within myself, I can't do that. It has to be God if I'm waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning before the sun rises. It has to be God. And I don't do it all the time perfectly, but what I'm trying to say in a spiritual sense that God's trying to wake us up. We need to be on guard. We need to be ready. We need to be watching and praying and letting this word be developed in our hearts so that we can go out into this world because look, we could just look around at this church and I mean, all of us are believers, you know, if not most or all are baptized in the Holy Spirit and so we're comfortable around each other. But when you walk out those doors, I can guarantee we could just walk into one lost soul mm -hmm. right beside him, drive right next to them at the gas station, at Walmart. This is a comfort zone right here. This is a comfortable place. This is a safe place. 
But are we keeping the Holy Ghost in this house? This physical house? Mm. Wow. Are we keeping him under this roof? Because really, in actuality, he's not really dwelling in this building, but he's dwelling in you right. and me. And that's just really this challenge that the Lord had really had to challenge me first, and I felt so strong in my heart to deliver that there's not really any time to waste. There's a harvest of souls out there. And it doesn't matter if you've been called to pulpit ministry, as they say. It doesn't matter if you've been, you're called to be a pastor, evangelist, you know, fivefold ministry. It doesn't matter. All of us are called to seek out the lost souls and to share the gospel. Every one of our pulpits is the streets out there. That's right. Our pulpit is the grocery store. Mm -hmm. Our pulpit is wherever we're at, really, sharing the gospel. And so I just wanted to share my heart with you guys and that the message of the cross is just not something that we're just going to get so happy about because it's set us free. But that we get so happy that it set us free that we want to see others set free. But it compels that much. Not because I'm happy that I've got the victory, but because I want to see others with the victory. Let it compel us that much. Let the love, as he, Paul says, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Let it compel us so much and motivate us to reach the soul, to reach the lost souls. Because I'm so thankful that one had shared it with me. Amen? Amen. And I might have not received it at that time, but let me tell you, you're planting seeds. Because yes. it was probably a couple months later that I really remembered it. And that seed, that seed that was planted, I mean, it came, it bloomed. Mm -hmm. Because someone thought it worthwhile to share the gospel with me. That's right. Amen. And don't, don't get discouraged if you don't see them wanting to accept the gospel right away. Because I'm a prime example who was wanting to run away. But God had his hand on me. Boy, did he have his hand <laughs> on me. So just... Be a faithful sower, sowing seeds. That's all we, we're called to do. Some are called to water, and some are called to plant. And I believe all of us are called just to share the simple gospel. Jesus saves. Wow. <laughs> we could say a couple words and see the lost saved. Because all I had to do was remember one word. That's right. And that was the name of Jesus. Right. Hallelujah. It was the name of Jesus. So let that name compel you. Let his love compel you. Let it be so deep and rooted in your heart that it moves you. Moves you. And I mean not just spiritually, but physically moves you to seek that lost soul. Amen. And that's all that I really have for us tonight. It's just, a, it's just a challenge in my own life. And I believe God wants to also place in his church and his body is to live out the message of the cross. Amen. That I don't want to, like I said in the beginning, I don't want it just to be terminology as it was for a whole year in my life. That it didn't really change me or others around me. But I want to make a difference for his kingdom in my generation, Amen. so that when my little ones, my nephews and my nieces, when they grow up, they're going to know about the name of Jesus, oh, amen. amen, in this wicked world, amen. as it just, oh, it's only going to grow more cold amen. and more rapid in sin. Amen. We think it's bad now. Well, the Bible already prophesied about what it's going to be like, yep. but are we ready for those times? Are we preparing ourselves as good soldiers? I guarantee a sergeant wouldn't want to put, actually I have a cousin, she was flat footed and so they didn't want to put her up there. And so she was really released. She couldn't do anything. And then also I hear of like people who have like some issues, health issues where they're not allowed to go in, whatever. You really have to be completely ready for a sergeant to really trust you on the front line prepared and I heard it Brooke Mark talk about it once before um, 
They wake up like at early morning, I think, and four o'clock in the morning to start their day. This is what Paul is talking about, the soldiers who start their day. They start their day at night, basically, so that they're ready. They're ready. So they can see out on the horizon that the enemy's coming. They're on guard. They got their armor on, their weapon right here on the side, and they got their brother right next to them, ready for battle. Are we ready for battle? Are we ready? It's time to wake up. It's time to arise out of sleep. It's time to be on guard. It's time to start watching and praying to seek out the lost souls. Amen. Hallelujah.